And we're on. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, everybody. Nice to see a full room. Uh, thank you all for, for coming. I'm David Kaplan. Uh, I'm executive director of the Global Investigative Journalism Network. We were going to show you a little bit about us, uh, but you'll just have to listen to me talk because we've got some technical issues. Um, we are the Global Association for uh, Investigative Journalists around the world. There didn't used to be one. A lot of national organizations, There's, there are some terrific uh, reporting organizations that, that do work uh, both locally and internationally. Uh, what there wasn't was a, a global association that would stand up for the rights and uh, do training and uh, provide resources and help to the world's most enterprising journalists. So we took an informal network in 2012 and uh, created a nonprofit. Since then, we've grown to 177 organizations in 76 countries. It includes uh, ICIJ, uh, IRP here in, in Italy, uh, ProPublica, and uh, uh, um, lots of other uh, uh, training institutes and uh, reporting organizations, centers for investigative reporting. Uh, it's exciting work. We're, we're very gratified to act as a, a bridge. We, we uh, communicate in eight languages every day, not in Italian, but we are in, in Arabic. Where's, where's Maj? Maj, raise your hand. Our Arabic editor is here. Um, uh, we're in uh, Chinese and, and Spanish and French, um, uh, eight languages altogether. Um, every day we put out the latest tips and tools and opportunities and resources for investigative journalists. Go to our website, please, gijn.org. Uh, check us out on Twitter, at gijn, and uh, you can find links to all sorts of other good stuff. We run a help desk because we, when we, we first started the nonprofit, we began getting a lot of requests from journalists all over the world uh, wanting help. Help, uh, not just in reporting, though that, that's the biggest category, but also in uh, what we call capacity building. We wanted to know how to start uh, their own reporting agency, how to create a nonprofit, uh, how, to, how, to be, uh, how to survive in an age when media is finding it so difficult uh, uh, to sustain itself. Um, so we, we've put more and more energy I into sustainability. Uh, I, I think we had... Um, uh, more than 1,600 requests for assistance last year, and, and sustainability was one of the largest uh, categories. So what we've done, you, you're getting the benefit of, uh, what is this, our fifth or sixth uh, road show. Uh, we, we've done this at conferences in Seoul, Korea, in, uh, um, uh, in Amman, Jordan, uh, in Johannesburg, Africa, um, to talk about how, uh, really, not just investigative journalism organizations, but any nonprofit media, really any startup media organization, uh, can survive. There, there are some winning formulas out there, and, and what we've done is put together uh, uh, kind of a, an all-star cast uh, here. I'm, I'm going to introduce them quickly, and then as we, we uh, come back to them, I'll, I'll do a little more in depth. Um, we, we have two um, ACE fundraisers. These are people who have raised um, millions and millions of dollars for nonprofit groups in, in the U.S. And, and overseas. To my left is, is Bridget Gallagher, who runs her own consulting firm out of New York. Gallagher, Gallagher Group. Group. And uh, you can find her uh, online. Next to Bridget is uh, Caroline Jarbo. Uh, who is GIJN's own fundraiser. Of course, Bridget was our fundraiser before that. But, um, and uh, I got to work with both of them at a, uh, a nonprofit in Washington, D.C. called the Center for Public Integrity. And um, uh, as an executive director, one of our main jobs is fundraising. Probably half my time goes into to fundraising. These two taught me pretty much everything I know. And our, our budget will be $1.6 million this year. But they've, they've worked with much bigger organizations. Um, uh, to my right is uh, Ross Settles, 
who um, uh, was one of the pioneers of, of investing in independent media. He helped start up a group in, in New York called the, the Media Development Investment Fund and is, is one of the smartest guys I know when it comes to sustainable media. He's, he's part of GIJN's brain trust, I'm, I'm happy to say. He's also a professor of entrepreneurial journalism at Hong Kong University and is in demand all over the world. Uh, we're we're going to end with uh, uh, another favorite of ours, uh, Emily Golikowski. Did I say that right? That was very close, Golikowski. Oh, God. It's closer than, closer than most. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, the, the Emily uh, is another pioneer. She works uh, also, uh, um, she's based on in New York at uh, uh, a nonprofit called the Membership Puzzle Project. Uh, membership models have really taken off and, and Emily has really been in, in the forefront and we're, we're just delighted that you've joined us uh, uh, again. So we're gonna run through f uh, uh, fundraising, how to think about fundraising, how to, how to craft proposals, how to deal with with, with donors and, and then we're gonna think about business models and really the commercial side of, of uh, sustainable media and, and then we're gonna pull back and, and look at uh, sort of a crowd-driven solution to, uh, to what happens. And we're, we're, we're gonna leave plenty of time for questions. So uh, if, if you do have um, um, uh, things that you're struggling with in your own organizations, this is, be, uh, there'll be plenty of time to uh, to ask those questions, okay? So, uh, w w with that said, um, uh, Bridget is, um, uh, uh, I, I, I used to call her my, my consigliere because she's really more than a, a fundraiser. She, she understands uh, nonprofit strategy and, and how to build an, an organization and, and she's really, uh, you know, one, one of the parents of, of GIJN. We started with $30,000 in startup money in, in 2012, and, and uh, because of your good advice, as, as I say, we're gonna hit 1.6 million. How did we do that, Bridget? <laughs> <laughs> we did that by viewing fundraising as a daily practice, a habit. Um, so, you know, some of the other clients I work with um, that you might see around here this week are ICIJ, um, Rappler.com and Maria Ressa, uh, Laurent Richard and Forbidden Stories, um, and a handful of other organizations um, in the US and internationally. So I've been in this space, uh, I've been a fundraiser for 20 years, I've been in the media and journalism space for 12 years, and I've had my firm for about the last 10 of them. Um, and you know, fundraising really is something that I think a lot of journalists who start um, or found an organization kind of dread. Um, it's, it tends to be their least favorite part of their job. Um, Dave, I think it's probably fair to say that that's the way you felt about it when we started working together. I still feel. <laughs> <laughs> but you're so good at it because you know you 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 understand the rules. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, Fundraising is a relationship. Um, there is no tool, there is no hack, there is no shortcut to getting this work done. It is something that if you are going to succeed at doing, uh, you have to devote some time to it every day. You have to be really disciplined about adhering to some fundamental rules and some good habits. And I think it's just useful to kind of go over those sort of ground rules that govern this relationship. So people give to people. Um, people give because they are asked. They give to people they know. Um, and <clears throat> One of the things that you have to be able to articulate to those people that you're having these conversations with, because that is how you will get all your most valuable, most generous gifts, um, is how does the donor benefit? We tend to think about fundraising, about asking for money as you know, charity, philanthropy, altruism. Um, and it is all of those things, but it's important for you to recognize that this is also a business transaction. And the person on the other end of that conversation, the person that you're talking to, uh, they need to get something out of this too. Maybe it's something as simple as a tax write-off. Maybe it's something as simple as you know, their logo on your, your print program to be recognized for their support. But maybe they have uh, really detailed schemes for how they're going to change the world and what you need to be able to tell them is how you play a role in that um, and how their partnership with you supports that. So that's how you have to attack these conversations. That's how you have to devise your strategy going into them. And in order to do that, you will need to be very well prepared. So that's sort of the, the first and kind of key habit for uh, a successful fundraising operation is solid preparation that you approach with a great deal of discipline. 
I think this should be easy for, for most of the journalists that I work with. This is a bit like uh, writing a profile of somebody or developing a source, right? You just want to get to know the person you're going to be sitting across the table from, um, get to know the foundation, if that's what it is, or the corporation or corporate social responsibility program you'll be pitching. Because again, these are, you know, if, if you're talking about those institutional donors, you're probably meeting with a program officer or a representative um, who have bosses and boards of directors that they report to. So you need to spend some time understanding how those organizations work, who's the person you're talking to and what's their role, um, what, are the, what are the overarching goals of the organization and how do you see your organization fitting into those, um, you know, how do you, who do you work with that they already fund, what are some of the names you can drop in your meeting or your introductory email to a person to kind of credential yourselves and help them map you onto the landscape of other people doing this work, because um, that's really going to make the difference in terms of how they can see a fit and help under help them understand how they're going to benefit from a relationship with you. Um, fortunately, this work has gotten a lot easier than when I first started doing it 20 years ago. Um, you know, there's a lot more information that you can get just from doing your basic desk research. You have um, Foundation Center and GuideStar just merged, so they're a new organization called Candid um, that. Um, is a database, searchable database of foundations, primarily in the US, um, better representation from Europe. Um, the rest of the world is a little bit ad hoc. Um, but there are, you know, there's the European Foundation Center. Uh, there are a handful of periodicals like Alliance Magazine out of the UK or Inside Philanthropy or Chronicle of Philanthropy in the United States that cover this sector. Um, and, you know, increasingly this has become a beat for popular news too. I think particularly in this journalism space because it's been so rapidly evolving. Um, it's attracted a ton of press. You know, I mean, this last weekend, um, Alberto Ibargan from the Knight Foundation was on, I think, Meet the Press, talking about investments that they had been making in the nonprofit journalism landscape in local news. So there are lots of sources for understanding you know, who the philanthropists are, um, how you might identify targets for your organization, um, and how they are making their grant making or philanthropic decisions. So spend some time before you pick up the phone, before you write that introductory email, spend some time getting to know that person, getting to know that organization, and understanding really clearly what your case to them is. How would they benefit from getting to know you? Um, and the other thing I would say is, you know, it's very attractive um, and very tempting, particularly for a startup organization, to see see um, Knight and Luminate and Open Society Foundation, you know, funding so many other organizations in the space um, and thinking that, you know, that's, that's where we should go. We, we really need to get that money. Um, and I would just encourage you to take a step back because, though, you know, everybody feels that way about them. <laughs> and it's an incredibly competitive process. Um, and so many times clients of mine have had more fruitful conversations, you know, thinking through that sort of, you know, cliched but effective six degrees of separation network to who do we know? Who who's maybe not the marquee journalism funder, but someone who has some resources, some interest in this work, and someone I can get a meeting with. Uh, so that's how I tend to advise my clients to think about identifying prospects and preparing to pitch them. Um, one more thing I would say is there's some preparation on your part to make sure that walking into that meeting, if it goes really well and they want to move forward, you, are, you know what that entails and you are prepared to accept gifts. You know, you're legally compliant, you're registered in whatever capacity makes sense for you. Um, you have the kind of um, accounting and or legal infrastructure to be able to process a grant agreement to report out on how you've spent money. Um, just to understand what kind of gifts maybe you do or do not want to accept. Are there certain types of funding that would be toxic to your organization or that would be tough for you to explain? Um, so a little bit of kind of self-interrogation um, before you start aggressively making asks is also worthwhile and will save you some time and probably some heartache in the end. And with that, I will turn it over to Caroline. Good afternoon. Uh, I want to talk about the process of um, creative storytelling as an essential component of fundraising. Oh, they're coming at me. <laughs> I want to talk about the process of creative storytelling as an essential component of fundraising. And what I'm going to talk about, I think, dovetails nicely with what Bridget was talking about before. I want, in specific, I want to give you some guidance on crafting written pitches and proposal writing, because if you have researched and met your prospects, you're going to be doing this very quickly, God willing. And I have to warn you at the outset, I want to invoke something of a stereotype of an American, which is that I am going to talk about religion. And my goal here 
for the next few minutes is to convince you that in order to raise funds for investigative journalism, you need to be an evangelist. Was anyone in the session at three o'clock with Maria Ressa and Laurent about um, forbidden stories? In Maria's mission, talking about um, we are at, we are communities we are communities of activists. So you are an evangelist for the work that you're doing. Investigative journalism is what you are proselytizing. And you need all the faithful adherents you can get, whether they are donors or members or the general public. And you don't know which members of the general public are suddenly going to turn into being your donors. So just a minute ago, you, you heard Bridget talking about donors give when the fundraiser has correctly identified their needs and met them. I'd like to look at that value proposition from something of a different angle, which is that you, investigative journalist, have something that the donor does need. And to take that religion analogy even further, it's essential to their life. They just don't know it yet. So it's your job to tell the donor that and why the work you do is important. So to do this, you have to do, uh, you have to do what in graduate school we used to call going meta and talk from the outside about your work. Slide one. So as you sit down to construct a written pitch, I urge you to find your starting point in the most urgent part of your work that can make the need for it apparent and emotionally relevant to your prospective donor. You need to draw the prospective donor into the human drama of why this story or this series, or this new editor, or newsroom expansion, or high quality recorder is absolutely critical right now. Investigative journalism in particular lends itself naturally to this kind of description because it, it often, mostly, exposes the differential in power relationships between the powerful and ordinary people. That's a great way to start a story in speaking to someone. Start there and find the moment where the stakes of your work are the most emotionally powerful as well as what are, what is the potential human cost of not reporting the story. It's usually possible to locate a crystallizing image or moment that can be your entry point and then render it vividly as the pithy reason for your work. And if you've researched your donors carefully enough, you will know why they will be likely to resonate with it. I can think of a lot of examples from others, but in my own work for GIJN, as we seek to empower investigative journalists, I come back to an image of voicelessness, a lack of access, representation, journalists in tough locations who want to tell a story and can't, whether due to lack of press freedom or a lack of connections to pitch to a global network or even a lack of skill to tell a story adequately and if we don't do our work, they can't tell their stories, and they will remain silent, and their stories will not be told on a global stage. The second aspect you should think deeply about is the question of your, what is your ethos? The old term from rhetoric about being a good person reasoning well. Why should you be the one telling this story or doing this work? And not only what are your qualifications, but even more, why are you trustworthy? Maybe it's because you did skillful reporting on an issue already, and now you realize there's a lot more to do on the same subject. Or maybe even you need to found a specialized outlet to deal with this particular kind of subject matter. Tell your origin story. I've uh, done some consulting with some folks who are here and have uh, sort of brought that out. Bring that, bring that authentic origin story to the fore of your writing about your work. Perhaps it's because of me, it's your member of a group that gives you special insight and experience in reporting on violence or inequality and how to expose those issues to redress them. Next slide. Once you've done this personal inventory, you're ready to move toward drafting the three components that will make up your proposal writing wardrobe, the concept paper, the paragraph pitch, and full proposal. The first piece you should draft is the concept paper in a tight one to three pages, 
and it's really great if you can do it in one. You cite the condition you've identified and why it's repurgent to respond now. That's your background or rationale, the reason for this work. Then you give the justification for why you are the one to report on it. What's your experience, skills, or the special insight that you provide? Finally, how will you conduct this project? Be precise about the numbers of stories, staff hires, and time frame for how long it will take. What kind of realistic impact do you envision? What metrics will you cite to show that you're reaching people, or even more important, changing minds? Being straightforward and clear is also part of your ethos and how you can convince donors you're capable. Your pitch paragraph. Can this slide three? Your pitch paragraph distills the essence of the concept paper down to, yes, a paragraph. What's the condition? Why are you or is your organization the best one to respond to it? And what, positively, what positive benefits will your donor support bring? You'll use this in initial emails to prospects, and it will become your convenient elevator pitch. Up here's an example that I made up from a bunch of different places I've worked. From our landmark reporting during the U.S. Civil Rights Movement history, this outlet has a special concern for the cause of racial equality theme, and that's why we want to investigate the outcome of new sentencing reforms, specific subject, on the criminal justice system, larger subject, in a web series, Deliverables, with accompanying video. In one sentence, you've established credibility, alluded to your skills, argued your passion, and set forth the project you want to do now, as well as the deliverables. So now imagine that your pitch paragraph has been successful and now you've been invited to submit a full proposal for your project, even for general operating support, which is the holy grail of funding because you can do what you want to with it. Full proposals will generally include a rationale for a project, why now, why you, project activities, where will you report, what resources will you use, project deliverables, how many stories, new hires, how will you distribute it? Evaluation and impact. What are the metrics you will use to measure the success of this work? Are they real? How will these reports contribute to a solution? Your full proposal will give you more space to talk about the dimensions of the problem and the people or environments that are suffering. That's that crystallizing moment that you started at the beginning. You can do in a lot more detail, um, but it's always good to be able to pull back and do the brief version as well. You should also show, realistically, how you can construct the project efficiently to have the most impo impact possible with uh, using your funds wisely. So make sure your passion, in sum, draws forth your donors. Your proposal, it's a love story to why this story, why now, why you, and it also makes the argument about what you will be able to do and the impact that you can have. Get a couple comments and before we move on to, to Ross, uh, um, one of the things um, you heard here is to use your journalism skills. Well, we have some advantages when it comes to writing proposals. We're writers. So Caroline's talking about storytelling. Use your passion, use your writing ability. Tell a story. Uh, what you, you, it's Unfortunately, it's a kind of sales, and, and we, we didn't get into this business to be <laughs> I didn't sales want to use that word. people. <laughs> we hate that, yeah. Um, but, but it's the same way that you, you sell a story to your editor. That's the kind of sales it is. You, it's, it's just it's a different kind of editor. Um, and it, it's, it's kind of an old fashioned business. People give you money because they trust you. And, and often the program officers at foundations, the, their job is on the line too. If they're giving out money, you need to make, they need to feel like you're gonna make them look good, or at least that you're gonna fulfill the, the, their job in the, am I right here? Yeah, I've got some knowledgeable people nodding their heads in the, <laughs> the audience. Um, uh, yeah, it, like in journalism with your sources, you have to develop a relationship. You've gotta develop some trust so that they think you're gonna complete the proposal that, that you're pitching. You know, Br Br Bridget taught me a, a great line about fundraising. If, if, if you want money, ask for advice. If you want advice, ask for money. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay. Uh, fundraising really occupies, uh, but we get over 90% of our budget from, uh, uh, from funding, but, but uh, we, like uh, IFJ, we put on conferences and we, we do make money from that and from some training, and this is an area we, we need to expand, as do most of our, our members. A lot of our members don't even have business plans. They're, they're, they're not thinking uh, in commercial terms. Even if you're starting a nonprofit, it's still a business. You still have to have a business plan. And, and, and you've got to be thinking uh, about budgets and, 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 and sound management techniques. Am I right, Ross Settles? <laughs> uh, oh, that's right, Mayor. Uh, so I'm not going to ask you guys to kind of wrench your heads a bit from the very high thinking conversation you just heard to sales. Uh, so many of you are interested in starting or you already members of or part of investigative journalism outlets. Many of you have heard you should be sustainable. That generally translates to selling ads, right? So I'm going to kind of talk to you specifically about commercial revenue and commercial sustainability in the context of IJ, in the context of investigative journalism. Because one, it's different and two, it's hard. It's harder than the normal selling of advertising or providing of services or even of business planning. So let's start by looking at investigative journalism. It is a challenge when it comes to business planning, right? If you're working in a operating newsroom, you're producing a certain number of stories every day, you have certain beats that you are covering, you have a regular audience that's somewhat predictable. Investigative journalism, on the other hand, is story driven. So a news outlet or a news media is a process, right? I can sell a process because it's predictable, it's recurring. Investigative journalism, on the other hand, could be a hit, or you may work for months on a story that you decide isn't worthy of telling. So it is a very different business planning proposition, which makes the commercial revenue opportunities very different. So one thing to think about is investigative journalism outlets, people that specialize in investigative journalism, are going to have a very different and more sophisticated, more complicated planning process than, say, a typical daily news outlet, all right? So one way of thinking about it is you have the investigative work here in gray. Let's say it's successful and the publisher decides to print. I come from the newspaper business, so everything is about printing. Uh, or you hit post, right? And then there is the publication impact, which could be dollars. It could be data in the day and age we live in. It could be awareness or impact of the subject you're rep reporting on, right? Ideally, it's all three things. So what that looks like to me, again, I come from the business side of the house. I started in ad sales. So what that little diagram looks like to me is some function of dollars over time. Right? So commercial revenue is trying to cover, it's trying to raise dollars from some sort of commercial relationship to cover the costs that are incurred over time. So what your investigative work looks like to my side of the house is that. You may, do, you may spend money for months exploring a story. It may be one or two reporters working on it on the side. It may be a dedicated reporter who's been given the time to do it. At some point, the newsroom says, there's something here, dig in. And then, the and then the expenses expand. Then there's a story to publish. Then you get into infographics and display and photography and layout. And so the expenses expand again. Then you come to distribution. You don't see any. There is no revenue opportunity to any of that expense. And I've been on, I've worked for news operations for close to 30 years. That timeline can be three weeks, three years, any place in between, right? So the question is, once it's published, there is generally a huge initial impact, depending on the subject, depending on the universe, depending on the audience. There's generally a follow. And then there's what we call the archival value. The story will sit there in the background. Google will serve some ads on it. But so the, the question is, how does this model allow you to make money in some sort of commercial relationship. And commercial relationship is about sales. You're going to identify either some by, either an audience byproduct or some process that you've done. It could be fact checking, it could be infographic development, it could be photos, but you're gonna identify something and somebody who wants to buy it. All right, so this is all about sales. 
and it sails in slightly more mercantile sense than, than uh, fundraising. So I'm going to kind of walk you through a few of my kind of some of my scar tissue from sales over 20 years. So one, commercial revenue does have a benefit. It's market facing. Uh, and the benefit of being market facing is you have to move. It's very easy to spend years on a story and have the entire audience in the day that we live in go from reading stories on their desktop to reading stories on their mobile phone in the period of the time you've been developing the story. So being forced to develop for the market, regardless of whether you make any money, it means you have to be responsive to what people are reading and how they're reading it, right? It's fast moving. The market moves as fast as your audience moves. It's relationship focused, right? It's just like what Bridget was talking about. It's very, it's very relationship focused. It's also compromise heavy. So one of the things that both Bridget and Caroline talked about is know yourself, know your the core, know what you stand for, because if you start to compromise on what you stand for, you've lost, you've lost the thread, right? And eventually you have nothing to sell. But it is very compromise heavy. Lastly, if you're lucky, it profit, it's profit generating, right? Don't do this just to make a little money. Uh, if you make a little money, you've probably lost, right? So what are the options, right? Usually we look at what you can sell on two dimensions. I'm not gonna go through the whole chart, but it's what I have to sell, and who can I sell it to? So we're looking at the right side of the chart. So selling, con selling content or services, and we're selling them to businesses, right? If you're selling it to an audience member or something, then it's really more of the art of what Emily's gonna talk to you in a second. So the steps are decide what you wanna sell and commit to it. Don't think, oh, I'm gonna go sell some ads and randomly choose somebody from the office, like a receptionist, to go knock on a door. You will fail. You will fail, and you'll look bad in front of the funders who have asked you to try that. So be serious about it. It says serious a business is reporting. It's just a different type of business. Um, so the first ch choice is choosing what to sell. So one, be serious about something you really to commit to. Two, be aware of who the competition is. So, and it's a bit like what Bridget was saying, you see OSF, you, the, the advertising or the, the publication equivalent of big, prop, uh, big uh, opportunities for sales. Don't assume you're going to sell them because everybody is selling them. It, it, do a little research. Use your investigative skills to find that sweet spot. Um, step two is really be hyper aware of yourself, right? Take an internal inventory. If you don't want to sell advertising, don't try it. It's a huge industry. It can be quite in, a gratifying industry. It can also be a really slimy industry. Sorry to any ad salespeople in the room. I'm, from your, I'm one of you. Um, be aware of what your own institution's economics look like. Are you a news organization doing in, in investigative journalism within it? Are you only an investigative journalism outlet? If you're an investigative journalism outlet only, how many stories are you prepared to do each year? Right? Be able to budget that. Even if you decide, I'm going to merge two stories into one, you're going to have to have some sense of what that curve looks like for you all year long. Um, know your strengths. So do not assume you're going to sell, you've built a big technology platform and you're going to sell it. If you don't have any tech people inside, you will fail. So know who you have to build on. Um, also know your weaknesses. Right? So if you have no contacts, I worked with a client recently in the Gulf, and they were very excited about selling advertising in Dubai, but yet they knew no one in Dubai. So it was kind of, you, you had to kind of keep asking the question, and why do you believe you're going to sell ads in Dubai? Who do you know? You, it's a very relationship business. Um, the last thing is try to look at yourself through somebody else's eyes, right? So try to step back and say, what would people, when I knock on the door, what are people going to see? It's very similar to what Bridget was saying. It'd be able to, to kind of get a sense of what people expect of you when you knock on the door. So that's the first step, or the kind of the preparatory, preparatory step, is kind of know your strengths and weaknesses. Know what you can build on. Don't build on stuff. Don't believe just because somebody says, oh, you should go sell some ads, that you can do that. Um, the next step is try, if possible, to innovate. 
So one of the challenges is selling ads is a commodity business. It's like selling salt, right? So if you're going to get into that, any of these businesses, whether it's selling ads or fact-checking or events or training services, figure out a way that you are going to do it uniquely from everybody else. If not, you're selling a commodity, right? So figure, spend some time thinking about it. This is actually a, a real workshop, a kind of an innovation workshop we did with a client in Malaysia a couple of years ago. And they were looking for ways of packaging past articles, right, archival material. So innovation is important because you don't have a lot of other assets. What you have is your own creativity and your knowledge of what you're doing, right? <coughs> then be prepared to go to market. So don't just assume you're going to have somebody in the room, somebody in your office, go knock on someone's door. You will almost certainly fail. Right? So if, you're going to, if you decide, we've built an interesting tech platform, I'm going to sell the technology. All right, there's a process. Who's selling it? Are they going to sell it once, or are they going to sell it over and over again? How are you going to get paid? The number of time I, times I work with small clients who actually have interesting data products or fact-checking products, and then they go out and sell them, and they have no concept of sending an invoice or getting paid or bank transfers. And in the end, months go by, and you, can't, you don't understand why they're cash poor, but sales rich. Uh, so be sure you know how you're going to get paid. Lastly, and probably most importantly, have an accountant, somebody in-house or somebody you work with who, who can do the math, right? It's not uncommon to sell something at any price that people will pay. Well, what happens is generally you add to the expenses of the company, right? On the commercial side of the house, our job is to make money. We have to pay for reporters' trips and data and evaluations, and so anything you do should have a, a margin, a profit margin. Ideally, it has what we call a keystone margin. So if, it's a ten do if it costs you $10, you're going to charge 10 to 20, 20 to 40. So if costs you 10, you're going to charge 40. Because you need all of that profit to pay salaries and rent and data and newswire. So, but be sure you do the math. It's a regular occurrence in my life. When you sit down with a client and you realize that they're doing a great job at sales and the reason is the prices are all too low. And everything they sell loses the money. It's not hard, it's just a little bit of accounting. So, I'm going to kind of wind up with a few success factors. One, plan. Planning is, Dave said, business planning is everything. Whether you're working in a recurring newsroom that does multiple stories every day and has different beats to work on, or whether you're working in an investigative journalism center and you're doing four investigations of depth each year, plan as carefully as you can. In some cases, I recommend planning every quarter, so redo it every quarter. It doesn't take long. Once you've set up the plan and the budget, redoing it on a regular basis, it forces you to ask questions like, okay, that story that we're working on, we've been developing it now for nine months, it's not going anywhere, kill it. Right? So part of the job here is being able to say enough. It's, take, it's taking too long. Uh, accounting is your friend, right? Accounting is your friend. If you don't have good accountants, or bookkeepers even, you'll end up spending a lot of time on commercial sustainability and commercial revenue, and it will frustrate you, it will anger you, it will embarrass you, and you will lose money. So don't do it. Get a good bookkeeper to help you manage the money, and lastly, be resilient. It's tough, and I'm sure it's the same in fundraising, is you'll knock on doors, whether you're trying to sell fact-checking services or promote an event or develop a, a, a data service or even sell advertising, if you knock on one door out of 10 and get somebody to respond positively, you're doing a great job. And it's a hard thing once you, whoever's knocking on the door comes back after the fifth time, it's like, this is never going to happen. Um, so be resilient. This is uh, the little chart on the right is from a colleague at Matter VC, which is a media development venture fund in San Francisco. He calls it the drunken walk of the entrepreneur, because in many cases you are an entrepreneur. Every story is like a new business, right? Every investigation is like a new effort. So lastly, these are my kind of words to the wise. What? Know your boundaries. The commercial side of the house is a compromise side of the house. If you don't know your core, you could easily compromise yourself out of existence. So know exactly what you stand for. 
Um, commercial sustainability is a lot of work, but there is benefit to it. Uh, market sustainability means you have to pay attention to the market. You can't just research and investigate and investigate and investigate, and in the end, you do a great report that three people see. So there is a benefit to being aware of the market, whether it's the revenue market, or more importantly, and this is kind of my segue to Emily, the audience market. Um, measure and improve, everything you do should measure, whether it's accounting or audience, measure and improve, measure and improve. And be absolutely honest in the space, because it's easy to get caught up in the, it's kind of the lemming effect of commercial sustain sustainability. First you're gonna sell ads, and then you're gonna sell technology, and then it's data services. Be aware of who you are, what your strengths are, who your team is, and be willing to say, look, that's all well and good for them, but we are not going to do that. Um, so with that, I'm going to segue over to Ms. Koglialski. Yeah? Thank you for that master class. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. I'm so glad this is recorded and I can, can go back and, and follow all of these notes um, in more detail. There's just two things that Ross shared that I want to underline. The first is no lazy math. I meet so many news organizations that do sort of this back of the envelope calculation based on what Spotify and Netflix charge. That is not business planning. Bring more <laughs> rigor to it. You will lose money if you do that. Um, and then the, the um, second idea is around knowing what you're not. So I think we throw around this term audience very broadly and you don't have one monolithic, faceless audience. You have audience members with their own needs and going and being fascinated with what those needs are and whether you might meet them. Also knowing that you're not gonna be a fit for everyone. You can only do what you are uniquely prepared to do better than anyone else in the world. Leave the rest to someone else is, is crucially important. So with that, I'll tell you a little bit about um, the Membership Puzzle Project, where I work at New York University um, with Jay Rosen and Ariel Zorolnik, both of whom are here at the festival. We're a public research project to study optimizing news for trust at a moment when it's badly needed. Uh, we work in collaboration with Day Correspondent, the Dutch member-funded newsroom that I'll talk about a little bit. And we study the social contract between news organizations and their audience members. We do this through, and this goes sort of clockwise on the slide, uh, through qualitative research, open publishing, communities of practice with reporters and audience development staff, and a new membership in News Fund to greenlight promising experiments in audience um, participation, governance, online to offline, offline to online learning, and more. Definitely check out the fund. It's supported by Democracy Fund and Luminate. Um, and we're really eager to give both advice and funding um, where to, to people who have exceptional ideas for pushing boundaries in membership in news. So plug is over, I'm standing down from my soapbox, um, to, and uh, I'll quickly just say, there is one point of distinction that I wanna make about audience revenue, only because we hear these terms conflated so often. Um, we think of subscription as a, a product-based transaction. I pay the New Yorker a hundred some dollars a year so that I can get access to their digital archives and a copy of their magazine in my mailbox each week. That's where our exchange starts and ends, and that's a perfectly happy relationship for, for what I expect of it. What our project is fascinated by, however, is membership that goes deeper and that's more interactive, in which individual members give their time, energy, money, and expertise to support a cause that, that they believe in. And this can go so far as to um, involve individual members being part of knowledge communities that can actually not just help the financial health of organizations that they benefit from, but also help the journalism, and I'm happy to talk more about that. Um, in the hundreds of supporters of independent news we've talked to around the world, there is very high cross-cultural consistency, and this is important, especially for those of you who work on global projects or who work across more than one region. Um, over and over again, we hear the idea that something feels broken 
whether that's with our public institutions um, and governments, whether that is with the social networks where we spend time online, whether that's with news, gasp. Um, and membership is one way to begin to restore what's broken. But what that looks like for publishers is being able to stand out, being distinct, offering smart takes with depth and integrity, and keeping your focus. This is again sort of this, this through line of being able to tell your story and the story that only you can tell. One organization that does this well, and I am not on their staff, but I do believe in their work, um, is Day Correspondent, which um, with about 60,000, now 62,000 members in the Netherlands, is about the, the size of the Wall Street Journal in its home country. Last year, they set out to raise money for a new English language site. And they did this by publicizing principles like, we don't just cover the problem, but also where we're coming from. And we don't take the view from nowhere. Um, and sort of this orientation around solutions-oriented reporting, um, and also tapping uh, members with relevant knowledge through a reader Rolodex that, that they created. Um, was really important, I think, for putting people at the center of their work. Um, in the process of, of doing this and, and also, you know, having a calming user experience and really inviting language, um, they brought 46,000 people from more than 130 countries around the world together as founding members. They raised $2.6 million to become the most participatory crowdfunding campaign in journalism history. Um, and, and I think that, yes, that's exciting. That number is thrilling. Um, but actually, the larger context is that's 46,000 people who felt that their current news options were not working for them and who wanted to see something different, that something that looked more like unbreaking the news. Um, they also talk a fair bit about having a robust privacy policy. And I would encourage you not to copy these principles, but to look at great examples from around the web, places like the Daily Maverick and its Reader Covenant document, which is one of the most human readable um, sort of uh, statements about the social contract between the site and its readers that I've ever seen. Um, I would encourage you to think about what is this sort of mission, vision, values that you might actually fact check with your own supporters to be able to say, this is how we view ourselves. Um, can you help us understand, is, does this actually hold up? So I think of this almost as um, being as rigorous with our own work as we are with anything that, that we fact check outside of it, um, or sort of production value parity, making sure that any of our marketing and fundraising materials are as high quality as the journalism that we produce. Just a few, um, two more slides, just some quick parting thoughts. Um, we also hear that uh, current and prospective members of news organizations around the world really want to see the people behind the organization. They feel that we've long made ourselves quite opaque. Um, and, you know, I frankly am disappointed and, and um, worried when I see that even longtime supporters of independent news can't name more than one or two people behind the news organizations they support. This means that when it comes time to um, look at a, you know, a credit card or debit card statement, even you know, something that, that you have offered to a Kickstarter or Patreon campaign, it can be a very easy line item to cross off when you can't actually conjure any of the people behind the work. Again, importance of human storytelling. Um, some other ways that we see organizations do this with great success is that um, they show that people behind the organization recognize that they don't have all the answers and ask for help where readers with expertise might be able to offer it. Um, there is no one transparency mode that works perfectly well for everyone. Um, but you might think about how can you be clearer about your people and what, what made them want to pursue investigative journalism in the first place, your processes, um, your responses to criticism, your financial health. 
And I say all of this with a major caveat, which is we are still studying, well, what does this look like in, um, in countries and in regions that are repressive to an independent press? And, and how might membership work in those contexts? Um, I would never urge you to um, put your staff or your financial documentation in a precarious position. But still, I think all of our organizations can be more thoughtful in sharing what our mission is um, and being fascinated with what it is that the community members we want to serve need from our work. Um, there's a, a design framework that I would, in, we don't have time to talk about it now, but would encourage you to think about um, when it comes to describing your work, which is the jobs to be done framework. And the idea is, what are the jobs that your investigative journalism um, accomplishes in your in your readers, viewers, and listeners' lives. Because with the exception of the people in this room, very few humans wake up every day and say, like, I would love some investigative journalism today. <laughs> what are the I, jobs I that you that, right? that you can solve for them? It's taking a much more human-centric approach. The last thing that um, that I wanna share with you um, is just a, a recap, and all of our materials for gathering research are publicly available on our site, membershippuzzle.org. Um, just a few parting words. With membership, members can contribute what they know, so it's a more robust, interactive, and inclusive relationship. We see over and over again that increased transparency helps earn trust when it's authentic, and that there are real differences between paid clubs and true communities. More and more we are starting to see organizations sort of promote their subscription offering as membership. And I am very wary of doing this because people are pretty savvy and they're, they're hip to what you're trying to pull. Um, if in fact they feel like the, the membership that you promised them was something you couldn't deliver on, you actually hurt everybody else and all other nonprofit news organizations in the space. So I would say, please act responsibly. Thank you. All right. I, I, I promised an all-star cast. You see why I was uh, confident in that. You, you know, when, when, when I started, uh, I had the good fortune to end up at, at the first nonprofit investigative journalism center, the original Center for Investigative Journalism in uh, San Francisco Bay Area. And it, it, it started in 1977. I, I started as a, a, a kid of, in my early 20s uh, in, in 1980. And uh, I was so excited, I literally ran to the office in, in, in the morning. Um, they, it had been founded, it was a product of the post-Watergate era, and it was founded by a bunch of freelancers and it was completely entrepreneurial. It never occurred to them because they were freelancers that, that uh, you didn't hustle, that, that every dollar didn't matter. So we charged for everything, every story we charged for. We syndicated our work. Uh, we, uh, uh, we, we had contracts with national TV, with the local TV uh, uh, affiliate for NBC. We got into documentary production. We, we did teaching and training. Uh, we, uh, um, uh, we did events, uh, and, and this has all kind of come into something called entrepreneurial journalism, and, and donors have embraced that it. it's become a, a, a big deal. But the original model really started this way, and we, we, we generated about 40% of our income through, uh, through commercial revenue. And uh, that, that, that's pretty hard to do today. Some of the groups, uh, particularly in the US where you have a big market and you have access to uh, more advertising and, and, and larger uh, uh, audiences um, are approaching that, like the Texas Tribune or, or uh, MinPost. Um, they're, they're, they're taking all these different uh, um, um, slices of the pie, membership models and, and fundraising and, and advertising and, and trying to find a, a, a more sustainable uh, base. And it's, it's, it's challenging. No, no one says that there's a, a magic solution to what's going on. And uh, you know, advertising keeps going down. Digital revenue is not replacing the, 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 the print dollars that, that we've lost. Um, but we're finding ways, and, and all these solutions are, are 
part of um, a part of the answer. So look, we've got uh, we've got a half hour. So uh, let's and we planned it that way because we wanted to hear from you. So uh, let's open it up for questions and. Um, uh, we want people to have mics when they uh, ask questions, right? Did they uh, get me there? Uh, well, we'll see what happens. Questions? Yes, there is a mic there. A room full of journalists and no questions. That's not really acceptable, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, come on, tell us what you're, uh, wor you're working on. Anybody have an innovative project and, and what are the challenges that, that you face? Yes, sir. We have we have a winner in the third row, in the middle. Um, hello, everyone. I have a very specific question for you. Hey, can you and, tell us uh, who you are? Yes, of course. I'm a freelance journalist. Uh, I used to work for the last four years in Turkey. So that's um, like my question is very specific about operating in countries in which starting new projects can be financially dangerous because you have to protect your resources. So let's say that I was successful in convincing some donors to, to give me some money to start a new project there, but then I have to deal with a financial and political environment that is not very friendly, so I would like to have your feedback and expertise from that point of view. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Um, well, if you, found, if you found angel investors, you found people to start you up, you know, I would say a couple of things. One, they've already trusted you. They, they've kind of accepted the initial risk of operations, right? Otherwise, you're not going anywhere. But if you can find that seed, then the question is really up to you. How bold do you want to be in the market? And, how, and can you find other people that are like that? There are other alternatives. I'm not, I don't, I've not worked in Turkey directly, but markets that are similar to Turkey, it's not uncommon to see people create kind of bifurcated organizations where you have half the organization or a significant part of the organization in a, in a second place so that you preserve some protections, uh, the archive, the hosting, some basic editorial, and then you do everything via uh, email, different types of chat bots, et cetera. Um, but, if you, if, but if you found the initial seed, then you've already gotten over the initial risk. The hard part is finding that. Uh, can I actually uh, ask Andrash to, to respond a bit to that? We, we have in the audience, can you give this gentleman the microphone? Uh, Andrash comes from Direct 36 in Hungary, which is one of the toughest places to operate, and he has the, one of the leading online investigative news sites. you have any survival tips? Uh, well, yeah, thanks for putting me on the spot. Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, Hungary is still uh, not nearly as bad as uh, Turkey or uh, Russia or uh, some other countries, but yeah, it's getting it's getting worse. Uh, I think what what we did that we basically we we stole or borrowed ideas from from others, and then we put together a model that is a, kind of like a mixed uh, revenue structure that we have. Um, Yes, we got grants from bigger foundations. Uh, we also have some commercial revenues that, uh, like uh, David explained, what they did at the Center for Investigative Journalism or Reporting, that we, we work for uh, some bigger TV, uh, TV stations. We do research for them. We sometimes, when now we take advantage of this uh, opportunity that Hungary is, uh, so much in the spotlight, so a lot of foreign journalists are coming to Hungary and we have this impossible language that nobody understands, so we do some translations for them and so basically we, we act as fixers and that pays quite well actually. Uh, and then, but the the, the biggest part is uh, uh, we are we st it started as crowdfunding and uh, basically a group of supporters, uh, a community we built. Uh, now we are trying to shift it into membership. Uh, so and that that has become uh, the 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 largest part of our budget now. So last year we could we had. Uh, we could cover more than 70% of our budget, which is about $200,000 per year uh, from that from that source. And the thing is that these two, I mean, these are helping each other. So if you have a strong uh, 
community, uh, you have a strong membership, uh, then uh, then you know the donors, big donors, are more willing to help you and give you give you money because they say that this is sustainable. I mean, having said all this, I mean, I think that one of the biggest challenges for us is that the, as the as the environment is getting more and more hostile in in Hungary, we already see that some of the so supporters, former supporters, or potential supporters, or even some big donors, they are uh, scared of uh, being uh, you know associated with a project like ours. They think that this is too risky for their. Uh, uh, for them uh, and uh, like uh, a couple of years ago we tried we 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 mapped we identified a few like local hungarian potential donors wealthy people who don't have any business with the government so uh, technically they are they shouldn't be afraid of uh, uh, helping a project like ours and then Practically all of them told us that sorry, we really like your project, but this is too risky. For, I don't, I don't want a massive tax audit uh, or anything like that uh, for my business. So they wanted to give you give us money in envelopes and <laughs> bags, and then we told them that sorry, but that doesn't work. Uh, you know, it's uh, and that that was two years ago, I think. Now it's it's even it's even worse. Can I just add to something that Andraja? was saying is one of the ways you can kind of reduce the risk is multiply the number of people that are funding. So if you can take in, uh, international contributions, if there's no, so in many countries in Southeast Asia and East Asia, if you are registered as a media operation, your, your international contributions are gazetted, they're not allowed, right? But if that's not the r rule in Turkey, or if there's a way that you can take electronic contributions, then what happens is you don't run into Andraj's problem. You, you want to build not two important donors. You, the way you get from the initial seed investment to operating is have a thousand recurring donors who put in the cup, a cup of coffee each month. Um, and then you just need to do kind of what Emily was saying earlier. You have some sort of transparency or some sort of protection for their identities. Um, and then it gives you a recurring base of revenue that is hard to find. It's hard to get to. Uh, we have a member in Malaysia uh, called Malaysia Kini, which is their leading online news site. And they suffered through years of repression. Uh, the government tried to take their license away. They brought them to court repeatedly. Uh, but uh, they had an incredibly loyal following. And, and at one point, uh, uh, they, they uh, built a new headquarters, and there's an entire wall of bricks that they crowdfunded, and each brick is a different person's name. It's incredibly moving when you go there and you, you visually see the support that their community has given. And, and when they were brought to court, that community would come out and help protect Malaysia. Kini, now democracy finally has returned to Malaysia and these guys are, they're building a TV network and they're, they're just off and running. Another question, folks? Yes, ma'am. Thanks, Andraj. Completely different subject. Um, I'm Megan Lucer. I'm the director of the Bureau Local in the UK, which is a, um, a collaborative reporting network. Um, and we're exploring business revenue opportunities, but because we're a collaborative network of both citizens and journalists, we are trying to think about revenue not purely to pay our salaries, but to fix the industry. And I'm quite curious on what the panel thinks about really what are the exciting frontiers that can collectively help all of us instead of kind of individually helping just me or just my organization? What are the most promising things? At the moment, it seems to be saying we need to have both a kind of uh, selection of fundraising and some revenue and some membership. I um, mean, everyone's kind of trying to kind of get their right jigsaw together to make their, their operation work. Um, but what we're trying to do at the moment in our, um, we've got some funding to try to think about this is, what is, the th what is something that we can kind of collectively tackle and I'm, obviously everyone's talking about membership but is there is there something that everyone's quite thinking about is on the horizon and I think the, the only way I've thought about it is what I'll 
enter in is that previously, obviously, news, the newspaper business sold money as a package, as you were a vital um, source of information for a community because the journalism was paid for by the ad revenue that was also interested in having sports pages and the weather. And you had a collection of information and it was a package that people needed. Now that the internet has desegregated that package, how do we fund the journalism itself? Um, and so I'm quite curious on, I think the future is, is in this reimagining what the information ecosystem looks like and what actually the package of information could be that is distinct from what the internet does. But I'm very curious to what the um, panel might have to say about that. Who would like to say Emily? Okay. I have some thoughts. If the, if the first bad word that we used up here was sales, I'll use the second, which is branding. I think that this is so important and really easy for us to forget of um, we're all humans first and we all have things that we're attracted to that are um, positive user experiences and I would really be thinking, and here I look at um, places like Mutante in Colombia that actually think of themselves more as an agency that is in the business of doing journalism. When you come at it from that perspective, what is an agency's job to, to bring people along in an endeavor and get them excited about something? Um, and so I would, I would start there, sort of the... Um, what might we do to, to boost our collective beauty on the internet, especially as most of us are removed from a, a print product? Um, and then I, th I love your question, Megan. I think two, um, two areas where I would like to see newsrooms sort of be more diligent and be more collaborative are around education. So what, what are the opportunities where you can throw open your own newsroom doors and open up your processes such that people can come along with them? Not with the idea that, oh, now you're training this whole new generation of journalists as the cost of journalism education is increasingly out of reach for many people around the world. Although that would be delightful, I think the idea here is if we show people how we work and give them opportunities to help us with our code bases, to help us with translation, um, to help us with fact checking and much, much more, that actually those are people who are much more likely to become longtime supporters of journalism because they have a deeper glance into what it is that goes into the work. The second thing that I think a lot about is participation. Like what are the, what are the ways that we might make small to large size asks that vary and that are all substantive. Um, one thing that I think is really important here, very often we're talking about participa participation in journalism um, as volunteering. And I actually would like to bring a bigger question, which is how might we recognize our volunteers' contributions in ways that are meaningful for them? So I've been really encouraged by seeing news organizations that say, no, actually, we really value your time and your talent, and so we're gonna go fundraise in other ways to be able to pay you, even if it's an hourly wage for the work that you do, because we know the product will be higher, and we know that you will feel valued. And I think that, um, that is something that I would like to see us do more as a field, which is like be less abusive um, of the of the people we're bringing along with us. Um, if I speak into the mic, so one thing is remember even back in the old newspaper days, it was a it was a portfolio of revenue. It wasn't just advertising; it was classified advertising and preprints. And so I think you're going to find that there is no holy grail. From my side of so I spend most of my time in East Asia. And I would say when you talk to advertisers, you talk to media, or you talk to net platforms like Facebook or WeChat, the, the single most common thing, whether it is in terms of developing product, developing stories, or developing revenue, is the word data. So this will probably be the third bad word you'll take away from this. But <laughs> being able to understand your audience, understand a story, understand your revenue in terms of the the most granular data you can get and being able to learn from that. If you can't do that, again, it, the, the more data you have, the faster you grow. Um, and so that, for me, is some of the biggest pro players in media in Asia. The newsroom is as much a data factory as it is a content factory. So. 
And I also think just, you know, pivoting um, from Emily's comment on, you know, branding kind of being something that you should be thoughtful about. I mean, I, I would extrapolate on that, I guess, and say that, you know, a lot of the journalists that I work with, I think, need to become better storytellers about themselves and their work. Just making that process transparent, making it clear how this happens, um, being really proactive and creative in thinking about impact and how you document that and share that with your with your donors, with your audience members. Because um, social change is hard. You know, I think all of us who do this work do it with some sense of mission, regardless of what kind of outlet you work for, with regardless of what your platform is. Um, you know, having information makes change. Um, so you need to kind of own your role in that and share that with your constituents and your donors. Um, and I think that that's one place where, you know, I, I tend to, to work a lot with clients to sort of get them to, you know, claim credit. Nobody's going to give it to you. So know where your work goes in the world and how people are using it and be able to share that with your stakeholders. From uh, the perspective of, of uh, our organization, the Global Investigative Journalism Network, you know, we're, we're very passionate about preserving and, and strengthening investigative journalism uh, around the world, and we will seize on almost any model that, that may work. So we're, we're working with universities that have created centers for investigative journalism that have become production centers and using student uh, uh, trainees to do it, and a lot of them are breaking extraordinary stories. We, we have a, a member at the University of British Columbia which just got a $2 million grant from Canada's Social Science Council to work with students, professors, journalists, and social uh, scientists in um, looking at supply chains around the world. It's a joint academic investigative reporting project. This is part of a whole new model of, of, of uh, doing things. And they raise that through really an academic uh, avenue. Uh, th there are, um, uh, you know, wholly commercial uh, enterprises like, like BuzzFeed has a terrific investigative team. They've been on the forefront of breaking news about, about uh, the, the fake news industry and, and, and uh, Russian hacking. Um, uh, it's, it's subsidized kind of in a traditional model through, through the, the, you know, the, the, the mother BuzzFeed um, uh, commercial stuff, the top ten lists and, and, and the, the, the really viral um, news that they push which, which subsidizes the I team and this is what classified ads used to do. So there's, there's another model. Um, there's the correspondent, which has done a brilliant job at creating its own, own community uh, and, and having that, in effect, crowdfund in a long-term way, um, serious, in-depth reporting. So we're, it's sort of, you know, let a thousand flowers uh, bloom time, and, and we're, we're trying different things and seeing, seeing what happens. We don't have a magic solution, so it's, and it's probably going to be a combination of this. So a couple more questions? Uh, yes, ma'am. Wait, wait for a mic and uh, um, can or oh, okay, sir, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Can you tell us who you are? Sure. My name is Joseph Farungu from Kenya, and you mentioned universities. Uh, first of all, I'm finding this incredibly um, valuable in the work that we do. We are experimenting with um, in investigative journalism in the form of a reality TV show in Kenya involving university students, final year students. It's basically a national mentorship program where we bring in sort of all the leading universities, each with a team, and they're trained and exposed to sort of media professionals. And then they're sent out to do real stories, real investigations, obviously not as deep and as dangerous as, as, as it can be. Um, and then these are published and broadcast. So sort of pop idol uh, X factor for journalism. And the and, and we've been doing this with the help of one donor and then raising some of the, some of the funding uh, locally in Kenya. Now my question is, we, we're now beginning to approach commercial partners sort of to experiment, for example, with product placing. And one of the challenges we are facing is the outcome of investigative journalism does not, it doesn't always sit pretty with, with, with commercial <laughs> advertisers. <laughs> so <laughs> what do you do when, you know, when the journalism itself, you know, people say, ouch, you know, I, I want to stay very far from <laughs> this. Uh, um, any advice? So all of the salespeople on the, on the panel here just laughed. <laughs> um, it, is, it happens, I don't know, every day. <laughs> um, 
this is what everybody said. Know your boundaries uh, and be prepared to walk away. Uh, if you can't walk away, um, in, in the end, you'll compromise yourself out of it. You're, you're, you'll be more reality TV show than investigative journalist outlet. I, I'll, I'll let some of my other uh, colleagues talk about it, but uh, it's a regular occurrence. Uh, having some guidelines for how to deal with it is important. Making sure that it escalates to the right level so that someone can actually say, you know, we're not doing that. Uh, but otherwise, that's what, that's what we've, all, we've all talked about. There are compromises to be had, so be prepared. Yeah, I mean, I think the, you know, the question to ask of the potential sponsor is, you know, what's more valuable, the sort of exposure to youth and young people that you have by virtue of, you know, using that university constituency versus the risk that those students are going to uncover something potentially unsavory about that particular sponsor or the business they work in. You know, if that's a risk they're willing to take, then it's a relationship worth having. Um, you know, I, but I, I think all of, you know, whether it's, it's a sponsor or a donor, I mean, just managing expectations and getting a gauge of their appetite for, you know, risk and versus reward is, you know, a critical part of the conversation too. If I could just add on to that, I think having those conversations about your boundaries and your sort of ethical orientation from the very beginning with these people and sort of, you know, take the high road because if you're not if you don't sort of put yourself out there in terms of what your own values are, they're going to assume that, you know, the, the funding dictates the values. Uh, also, don't, don't be afraid to, to look outside the box at potential sponsors. The, the, the markets are changing and, and technology is driving that. In, in the last few years, we've had a whole new market open up for documentary and, and, and um, uh, online news through, through YouTube and Netflix. And, and, and documentary makers are now able to sell stuff direct. They love nonfiction stories and and who does that we happen to be the content king kings of that uh, telecommunications companies um, uh, uh, you know online media there, there's 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 starting to be more and more side doors and you know the, the technology has has uh, industry pretty well destroyed the news media but it's also opening up important opportunities so you have to befriend it and 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 look for opportunities okay can we get uh, th this this woman over here hi I'm Elena uh, I'm adjunct professor professor in uh, Milan University uh, I teach communication uh, at uh, international students uh, coming from I don't know Australia to Mexico uh, and uh, last year I founded a startup in an in an innovative startup um, to publish an online magazine um, to investigate on brand communication. Uh, so the aim is to discover, um, especially now that sustainability uh, is a very high topic, if brands communicating on their sustainability are actually uh, to, uh, walking the talk. Uh, so my um, idea is, uh, I think is original, because of the topic uh, and because we are also using, uh, mm, uh, let's say, um, fact-checking uh, within a uh, specific topic, which is um, brand communication. So my question is how to uh, cross uh, mm, Italian boundaries to bring this idea outside uh, my country, um, especially knowing that um, as I am a professor and I'm dealing with uh, international students and also we started with our um, English uh, and Italian version of the magazine. That could be something that actually can scale and not only be an Italian uh, way of viewing investigation on uh, brands. Thank you. Yeah. Um, um, so just so I understand the concept. so. Uh, there is a publication, I don't know, where, where is Adbusters from? Adbusters yeah. is a Canadian magazine, yeah? So the, uh, Adbusters is a Canadian magazine, but it sounds like it does something quite similar, where they will, let us say that you are Benetton, or you are Coca-Cola, and you have a, a social responsibility system about being carbon neutral, but yet you are the largest energy user in the state of Georgia. Um, and the question is, how would you internationalize the concept as a university professor? 
Um, you know, the, I, I, I like the conversations model, which is they kind of created a, a, a model and the, a, a set of branding and a set of approaches, but then it's almost like it's a franchise, right? Uh, where they offer you, here's the kit, here's the approach, here's what we're looking for, you must adhere to these, these processes in order to continue to be part of the network. Um, and then you let them go and kind of interpret it as it would be interpreted in, say, Australia or in the US. But um, I look at Adbusters. It's a pretty successful product up uh, in both in the US and Canada. Yeah. I don't know, anybody else? Um, this is not a great answer for you, caveat, but um, I would look at where are there sort of born digital um, organizations that are startups that l really launched with conversation. So I think of Aos Fatos in Brazil, totally different topic, which is sort of government misinformation, misinformation. And they are have be become such a leader in fact checking that they're now getting about you know 50 messages on WhatsApp from different followers of theirs a day saying hey I saw this and it just doesn't feel right can you look into this so I might actually start by asking what asking prospective audience members like what questions do you have and what brands do you want to know about as sort of a okay these are our first five brands we're gonna look into and I have a hunch that the brands that come back may surprise you and that's fantastic. That means like you're already starting in a in a sort of crowd savvy way. Okay, I think we've got time for one more question. Anybody uh, got one? There's been a good set of comments and and queries. So, um, you sure we got nothing to to end on? Going once, going twice. All right, I'm going to end this, and uh, what a great audience. Thank you very much, and uh, we'll, we'll see you over drinks. <laughs>